Hey, it's good to be with you again. Can you believe it? It's time to celebrate Christmas again. It seems like to me it was about six weeks ago we had Christmas, but it's here again and we have the privilege of celebrating the birth of Jesus. It's not about stores or trees or decorations. I love all those things, but at the heart of all this activity and our, our busier than normal calendars is a reminder that God sent his son to change our lives. We're going to take a few weeks together and walk towards Christmas, not just to prepare our shopping list, but prepare our hearts to receive what God has for us. I'm excited for what he's going to do in our lives this Christmas season. I believe the lesson today will be a blessing to you. Enjoy it. And I want to start with a very simple idea. It's that hope has an object in your life. Hope is not arbitrary. It's not just a feeling or a thought or an emotional response. Hope is something tangible. It's a force and hope has an object. Now I want to ask you a question and I don't want you to answer out loud. In fact, I'd probably prefer you don't answer while you're here. I want you to reflect on it because we're in church and we all know the answer to every question is Jesus. But in this case, here's the question. What are you hoping for? What is the object of your hope? What are you counting on? What do you believe is going to bring security to you? What is the object of your hope? First Peter chapter one and verse three, we're given a clue. It says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. New birth into a living hope. It's an interesting choice of words. Our hope as Christ followers is seated, centered, anchored in. The foundation of it is something that's alive. It's a person. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. We believe he's the son of God, the Messiah. He brings hope to our lives in time and in eternity. He is our security. My hope is in Jesus. My hope isn't in the economy. My hope isn't in a politician. My hope isn't in my own strength or my own diligence or my academics or my education or my contacts. My hope is centered in Jesus. Now, I appreciate all of those other things, and they can add value and bring meaning to our lives. They're not necessarily unimportant or insignificant, but they are not my point of hope because they are all destined to fail. They have limits. My hope reaches into eternity. My hope reaches beyond time. I have hope beyond this life. That affects how I will live in time. Now I'll ask you the question again, what's your hope secured by? What's your hope anchored to? What are you hoping for? In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, it says, On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. We have set our hope in Jesus. Now, I don't want you to hide behind the myth that we're in church on a holiday weekend. In the reality of your heart and your life, when you're away from this place, in the quiet spaces of your life, what have you set your hope on? Because one of the things we might need to initiate this weekend is, is a readjustment, a transfer of our hope. It's highly possible we as God's people, church folk, have put our hope in things that are not trustworthy. It's not that they're not good things or even beneficial things or valuable things, but they're unstable. They're not an adequate place. They don't reach beyond time. If you have anchored your hope on something that is subject to time, what will you do in eternity? What will you do? We need a hope that reaches beyond time. It's a really serious issue. It's one Paul took up when he wrote to Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. It's a very plain passage. Paul says to Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in their wealth. Now, it's not a condemnation of wealth. God is not opposed to wealth. The Bible says God's the one who gives you the ability to gain wealth, to accumulate wealth. So if you've got that stuck in your heart, I want to encourage you to pull that out by the roots. It's not helpful. Sometimes we're angry at people that have more than we do. You know, that's not a helpful attitude. If you're angry at somebody that has a blessing that you don't have, it keeps you from being able to be blessed. Come on. 
He says, command those who are, are wealthy in this world not to put their trust in their riches. By, the Bible doesn't condemn money. Money's not inherently evil. If yours bothers you, bring it to me. <laughs> I will unburden your soul. <laughs> what the Bible does say is the love of money is the root of all evil. You don't even have to have money to love it. Isn't that right? I mean, you can, you can give your heart to it and not even have any. But it says it does warn us. The Bible tells us that wealth is deceitful. That to be deceived is to, to believe something to be true that in reality is not true. And wealth is deceitful because it will cause you to believe that you can secure your own future. That you can adequately watch over yourselves or those you love about, or guarantee outcomes. And that's just not true. Wealth is uncertain. So God is reminding us not to put our trust in wealth. It's uncertain. But in, in contrast, to put our hope in God. You can have a great deal and still put your hope in God. Resources give you options. They're tools. They're not something to be worshipped. Put our hope in God. Here's the question again. What have you put your hope in? And to the degree that we have allowed it to be invested in something other than God, we've gathered here today to say, Lord, we want to put our hope in you. You're the one who secures our future. I trust you. Creator God, almighty God, the living God who watches over the earth and everything that's in it. Not a sparrow falls to the ground without God taking note. I trust you with my future. Now that has to be cultivated and watched over in our lives. And sometimes even as religious people, we'll misplace hope. You know, I've already told you I like the Christmas season. It's that point, one of those points in our, our year, in our calendar, when we stop and celebrate God's eternal purposes becoming visible in our world. And in a high drama, spectacular way. Sometimes we go through seasons where God's purposes don't seem as visible, don't we? And then some seasons they break into the open and there's, there's a celebration around that. Well, Christmas is the ultimate celebration of God's eternal purposes becoming visible. But God's purpose in your life and mine requires a bit of an adjustment. If we don't guard our hearts, we'll think of God's purposes in our lives as an intrusion. See, I think the reality in our lives, at least when we begin our journey as Christ followers, is our objective isn't to let the purposes of God emerge in our life. I want God's power to let my purposes emerge in life. What I'm really after is how do I get the power of Almighty God at work in me so I can get my way more fully? Not necessarily wicked, pretty normal human response. But God invites us towards something else. To let his purposes emerge in our lives. Then I want to make a suggestion that it takes a little bit of an adjustment in how we think and how we approach our days to understand that God's purposes are not an interruption. That when you recognize God's purpose, not to process it as an intrusion or an interruption. Say, so, well, I wouldn't do that, but I find in my life I'm tempted to do that. Take the familiar characters from the Christmas story for just a moment. Mary, the Bible says, was highly favored. God had an assignment for her. A very personal assignment, wouldn't you say? I'm thinking that's about as personal as it gets. But it would have been really easy for Mary to think of that as kind of an intrusion. After all, she already had a life planned. She had a fiancé. She had a wedding planned. They'd already picked out invitations. They had a date. I bet they had showers scheduled. And she gets this little encounter with an angel that brings her good news. Mama? And now Mary's got this rather awkward conversation with Joseph. Joseph, I got some really good news. It's a God thing. Sure it is. Sure it is. It'd be really easy for Mary to look at that as an interruption, wouldn't it? That's not my plan. That wasn't what I had imagined. We didn't want to begin our marriage with a newborn. Or how about the shepherds that are invited into that scene when the baby's born? Interrupted their plan. They were busy at work. They had quotas to meet. And the angel redirects them into Bethlehem and off they go to, to find a stable. And sure enough, there's Mary and Joseph and a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. I would submit to you they're never the same again. They're invited to be observers. They've got a little bit less personal role, but they're, nevertheless, they're invited to the dance. I would submit it changed him forever. It's more than 30 years before Jesus begins his public ministry. 
But at least in my imagination, I, I'm, I'm quite certain that those shepherds stood in the crowds where Jesus ministered. Don't you know they did? They're older, a lot of years have passed. Don't you know they've told and retold and retold that story until their kids are sick of it? Do we have to hear what the angels said one more time? You do, shut up and listen. But I can see him standing on the periphery. There. I can see their, their kids 30 years later, their adults themselves standing in that crowd. Can you believe? Is it really him? Or how about Joseph? He's invited into that God scenario in a very personal way, but, but in a very different way. I think somehow to me there's a little awkwardness, a little overcoming would have to be done on Joseph's part. A little rearrangement of his ego, of his pride, of his imagination, because he's got the assignment to father a child, to love his bride in a very unusual circumstance. He has a God assignment, but his God assignment requires him to, to, to rearrange his ego and his imagination and his dreams and, and to make space for the purposes of God. Do you have an imagination that when God moves in your life, it could cause you to have to deal with ego and overcome some things and make some adjustments? See, I think we've believed that if God emerged in our lives, it'd be like winning the lottery every morning. Just more and abundance and enough and problems melting and be no internal challenges or obstacles. That's not what the Bible invites us towards. See, our hope is secured not by ease or convenient or comfort, but by the eternal promises of Almighty God. That there's something worth investing our lives in, giving our thoughts to and our minds to and our hearts to. God's purposes are not an interruption, they're an invitation. You up for that? Hmm. Sometimes I regret the way we, we um, invite people towards faith in our culture. Uh, I think we, we load it pretty heavy on the front end sometimes. And I don't think that's wicked or evil, but I think sometimes it sets us up for discouragement. We spend a lot of time and we talk to new people, people that aren't Christians yet or Christ followers yet and thinking about perhaps the journey. We, we're trying to warn them away from something. We believe there's a, a heaven ahead of us, but we also think hell is real. And so when you think about introductions to Christianity, they, they usually begin with a discussion about hell. And, and we say to people, you don't want to go there. And you know, that's really true. I believe in hell. And I mean, it's worse than like a long sermon. It's real that if you choose not to honor God in your life, God said, it's okay. He'll give you that freedom and you can spend eternity apart from him. Not a good place. And so we pitch Christianity oftentimes in terms of how do you avoid that? It's a gift. You don't earn it or qualify for it. It's not about joining the right church or, or learning a creedal statement. It, it says that you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus of Nazareth is Lord. And if you'll do that, you can be saved. Isn't that amazing? Your entire life and eternity can be changed as an expression of a gift from Creator God. That's amazing. So I don't want to diminish the, that invitation and the way it's presented, but here's the part that I think isn't helpful. So often we kind of imagine that once that is done, we're pretty much done. Not going to hell. I done believed and confessed. Have you done that? If you haven't, you might be going south. And I don't mean Alabama. <laughs> but I'm in. And it leads to kind of a smug, self-righteous arrogance. It's not helpful. Because see, the, the point of conversion, the point of new, the new birth, isn't so we can relax and go, all done. We've been birthed into the kingdom so the purposes of God can emerge in our lives. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. 
Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now faith is. Faith is about now. Hope is about the future. If you don't have hope, your faith will wither. It's not an either or proposition. It's not one is, is golden and the other is to be avoided. We need both. Hope protects your faith. Hope is about what's out there in front of us. We have a hope. We may be in a difficult season or a challenging time or even a, a disappointing season, but I have hope that the one who promised is faithful. And seasons change and opportunities come and God is a restorer, a rebuilder, a renewer. He is worth serving. We learn that lesson from all sorts of characters in Scripture. Daniel is a slave in Babylon, a long way from Jerusalem, living a very difficult life. But the Bible tells us he is highly favored by God. He didn't give up his hope. See, sometimes we abandon our hope when our circumstances don't go the way we want them to. Well, God, if you're not going to do what I want, I'm not going to trust you. It's an understandable response, but it is a very childish one. You know, as a little fella, if I didn't get my way, I might have tried sitting in the floor and kicking. Once, <laughs> Dr. Jackson frowned upon such expressions. In fact, he did more than frown. <laughs> we won't go there. Hope relates to the future. There's a second lesson in hope I would submit to you, and that has to do with wrestling with despair. Some of us want to pretend like if we're Christ followers and we're, we're godly people and we're seeking the Lord that we never do this, that we never wrestle with despair or discouragement or hopelessness. But the reality is there are times and seasons in all of our lives when despair moves in. It's like fog in the early morning. We don't like it. Now, hopelessness doesn't come all at once. Being without hope is the result, not usually of a singular event, but a whole series of events. We lose hope one slice at a time. Kind of like on Thanksgiving when you, do too, you eat too much. You don't do it all at once. It's not the one meal you eat, it's the four meals you eat all day long. Please take the food away. Well, hopelessness comes like that. One slice at a time until you finally find yourself after a whole series of events without hope. Paul did it. He was on board a ship on his way to Rome. And they encountered one difficulty after another until it says, finally, all hope of being saved was lost. They'd done everything they needed to do, and they'd lost all hope. Some of you know what that's like today. Some of you are somewhere along that path. And the best image I have for myself is that you wrestle with despair. It's a full contact sport. And any place you yield, despair will fill that space. And sometimes you grow weary in doing good. You get tired of pushing back on it. You think, you know, I, I'm just going to surrender, but that's not helpful because then despair pins you. There's a marvelous psalm in Psalm chapter 25 and verse 1. It says, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Listen to what the psalmist says. To you, O Lord, I will lift up my mind. To you, I will lift up my emotions. You have to present your emotions to God, your thoughts to God. They're not just yours. Well, it's how I feel. I understand it's how I feel. But God, I need your help with my feelings. Because my feelings can be kind of fickle. My feelings can be affected by what people say to me or how they look at me or what the weather's doing. God, I'm going to lift up my feelings to you. To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O oh my God. Don't let me be put to shame. Or let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. That's a powerful statement. No one will ever, no one whose hope in you is in you will ever be put to shame. May I ask the question again? What have you placed your hope in? Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. I don't believe that's just poetic language. I hear the psalmist wrestling a bit with despair. To you, O oh Lord, I will lift up my mind and my thoughts and my emotions. Lord, my hope is in you, because no one who's put their hope in you has ever faced shame. You are my deliverer. You are my God. It's important. Folks, if you're walking through a difficult season, 
I want to encourage you not to focus your thoughts on the inappropriate things that have been expressed towards you. On the disappointment. You know what a disappointment is, right? It's an appointment you didn't make that intrudes. Something that shows up that didn't have an appointment. Well, I wasn't expecting you. Exactly. And it's easy for disappointments to interrupt your, your, your faith. It's easy for them to interrupt your momentum with the Lord. I meet people who have had disappointments and they've spent 20 years derailed, sidetracked because of the bitterness of the disappointment. I'm not saying it isn't a legitimate disappointment, that it wasn't painful. I'm suggesting we've got to have a different response. Let's put our hope in God and say, God, I believe you are well able to restore, to deliver, to renew. The Bible says that a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. God can do a, in a moment in time what you and I have failed to do over decades. You may have failed in your life. Sometimes we're disappointed with ourselves and the guilt and the shame from our own ungodliness. From the train wreck in the wake of our life. Sometimes it's the godlessness of other people. Joseph is probably the, the classical example of this. His brothers sell him as a slave. I mean, that'd be tough. You know, I've, I've got brothers and I've done some things. I've locked them in stalls and sprayed them with water. And, I mean, I've messed with them a little bit, but it never occurred to me I could sell them. I mean, his brothers sell him as a slave. And it doesn't stop there. There, there. There's one event after another. But in one day, God takes Joseph from the prisons of Egypt to the prime minister's office. In one day. Our God is a restoring God. And if you're wrestling with despair and discouragement and hopelessness, don't give up your hope. Turn your heart, your mind, your thoughts. Lift them before the Lord. I'll give you one more. Hope is strengthened through expression. Hope needs to be something more than just an idea that you hold in your heart or a thought that you carry or a quiet prayer. In Hebrews 10 and verse 23, it says, Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. See, the things that set apart the people of God... It's not so much about the rules we keep and our attempts to be self-righteous because we can't achieve it that way. What really brings a transforming power to our lives is we have a hope, a confidence in Almighty God that the one who promised is faithful. And we can trust him with our futures, with our lives, with our well-being, even if in the moment the circumstances are unpleasant or difficult. See, hope has a partner. In Scripture, consistently. You know what hope's partner is? Perseverance. Ah, don't you wish it were chocolate? <laughs> now, wouldn't it be good if the Bible said, eat more chocolate and your hope will grow? We'd all be fluffy, hopeful people. <laughs> but the Bible says that we have to have perseverance. Now, here's what I don't like about perseverance. You can't order it. You can't go to Walmart and get a carton. You can't go online on Cyber Monday and order a double truckload of perseverance. The only way to get perseverance is by persevering. Oh. That's one of those awkward truths in life. You know, another awkward truth this time of year is the only real way to lose weight is you have to take in fewer calories than the ones you're burning. Isn't that just bad news? <laughs> Don't you wish you could watch people exercise and lose weight? <laughs> Bring me more dessert, the ball game's on. I'm feeling weak. But it doesn't work that way. And perseverance only comes in your life when you're willing to persevere. So if God has invited you into a season where you're required to persevere, don't be discouraged, be encouraged. God has, God has touched you. He's called you. He shined his light on your life. In the same way he did with Mary or Joseph or the shepherds or any of the other familiar folks in that cast of characters, God's inviting you towards his purposes. Give expression to your hope. Say, God, I put my trust in you. I will hope. I do believe you have a purpose for my life and a plan. And, and that while it may be unpleasant in the season, that you will lift me above it. God, my hope is in you. 
If I don't like my circumstances, if the relationships around me right now are not fulfilling and they're not satisfying and they're not bringing the things I need, God, my hope is in you that you're a faithful God. You're a trustworthy God. I can count on you. God, I believe in you. I give expression to it. It's important. Give voice to your hope. It'll change your life. A hope is a very important part of honoring God with our lives and, and living an effective life for the kingdom of God. Uh, hope matters. Hope will protect your faith. Uh, if we lose hope or if we give up our hope, it opens the doorway to despair and discouragement. So we don't want to do that. I want to leave you with just one simple idea on a daily basis. Give voice to your hope. Give some expression to the hope that's in your heart, even if it's just a spark that you're trying to, to help kindle into a, a full-blown fire. Give voice to it. Lord, I believe in you. Lord, you're my rock. You're my deliverer. You are a faithful God. You're a trustworthy God. If you don't have people that will accept those statements from you, you offer them to the Lord as simple sentences of expression. They will strengthen your hope. It'll cause your faith to grow and it'll take you through difficult seasons. God is faithful and don't, let you, don't you let go of that. I wanna pray with you. Father, I pray for every person that the spirit of a living God will bring hope to their lives this Christmas season in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online at intendministries.org and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today and if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.